Okay, so as I mentioned in the introduction, um, uncertainty is actually a very difficult concept um, to communicate to people. Um, and it can have long lasting ramifications and important ramifications. Um, right now we're in the middle of a pandemic and epidemiologists are struggling to communicate the uncertainty of their estimates. There are huge battles over the, or the, the confidence intervals in the estimates for different models. Um, it's even become conspiracy theories because the estimates are so wide. Um, so like there are human lives at stake often when you're dealing with policy and with uh, medical applications of uncertainty and with military applications of uncertainty. Um, one of the best examples of this is in the early 1960s, um, John F. Kennedy was interested in potentially launching a coup against Fidel Castro in Cuba. Um, and based on a whole bunch of different military plans that President Eisenhower before him had drawn up, um, he felt that it might be possible to invade Cuba with some former um, Cuban military officers and overthrow the regime there. Um, and so he consulted with members of the Pentagon and members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to figure out if this would potentially be a good plan to invade Cuba. Um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when he was talking to them during his cabinet meeting, told him that there was a fair chance of success given the plans that they had, they had drawn up. And so President Kennedy and the rest of the executive branch figured that was a pretty good shot, having a fair chance of success. And so they decided to launch it. Um, and as we know from history, it was actually a very failed operation. It didn't work, um, and it was a huge international embarrassment in the middle of the Cold War. And so what's fascinating about this, and it's become kind of a case study in the world of uncertainty, is that when the Joint Chiefs of Staff said fair chance of success, that was actually Pentagon speak for having a three to one chance of failure which means it only had a 25% chance of success, which is wildly different than thinking, we have a pretty good shot at this. It's actually the opposite. We have a pretty good shot of not doing this. Um, but within the Pentagon, whenever they quantified um, uncertainty, they would use language like fair or good, and those translated to different percentages than me or you would be familiar with. Um, and so because of that miscommunication there, um, we potentially tried to invade Cuba on bad perceptions of uncertainty. Um, we misperceived that, um, which is bad. Uh, people died because they didn't understand what fair meant to the people who had created the data. Um, and so we want to avoid that when we're talking about uncertainty. Um, but it's difficult because we as humans naturally hate the idea of uncertainty and it's really hard for us to grasp because it's just kind of a, a different concept. Um, one example of this from your readings is the difference between saying that there's a one in five chance of something happening versus 20 or a 20% 20 chance of something happening. Those are identical numbers. Those are identical odds. Um, but when we're talking about one in five, um, you can apply that to kind of something you can see. If you're talking about if 20% of the room is going to get a disease or have something happen to them, you can say, if there are five people here, one of them will get it. And that makes a lot more sense than saying 20%, which is kind of more abstract. It's not connected to real units. And so it's harder to perceive when it's in percent land like that. Um, you can actually visualize this. This is the same thing too. This is one in five. So two of those yellow dots are um, kind of the chance of success out of these 10 dots here. And so that's also a one in five chance or a 20% chance. Um, but visually that kind of, it makes more sense to look at it like that uh, because we can see clearly that there are two yellow dots and there's a whole bunch of other non-yellow dots, but there's still a good chance of hitting those yellow dots. Um, and so when we try to interpret percentages like this, it doesn't really make sense readily. Um, it's easier to translate that into either points um, because we can see those visually or numbers that are actual units of things like one in five versus just chances, um, percent chances, because that, that's hard to understand. Um, the election forecasting world and uh, political reporters, they face this all the time where people misunderstand what probability actually is um, because we see percentages and we assume that that's some sort of probability or something. Um, and so these graphs here, um, this is from the website 538. This is from the 2018 midterm elections in the United States. Um, so this is in Utah, which is a very solid Republican state. Democrats rarely, rarely, rarely win. Um, this is from when Mitt Romney, who was the um, presidential candidate against Barack Obama in 2012, ran for the Senate in Utah. Um, and so this is a, a week or so before the midterm elections in November. Um, given 
kind of the polls that 538 was looking at, um, Mitt Romney had a 99.9% .9 chance of winning. Um, but this got frustrating for lots of people, including the 538 reporters, because they got lots of pushback on this, where they said, like, they're saying Mitt Romney is going to win, but if you look at his polling numbers down here, um, he was predicted to get about 60% of the vote. And so people were saying that this was rigged. He should be getting 99% of the vote, not 60%, um, because he has a 99% chance of winning. But those two things are actually totally different numbers. Um, this is um, the probability of winning, where 538 has a complicated model that they run, and they essentially do simulations. They do 10,000 simulations, and they count how many simulations have Mitt Romney winning versus how many have him losing, and they figure out the proportion of that, and that is that 99% chance. This vote share doesn't really have anything to do with the probability. Um, this says he'll most likely get 60% of the vote, plus or minus some shaded area around here. And Jenny Wilson, his opponent, was predicted to get about 30% of the vote, plus or minus something around there. Um, but that's not probability. This is the, the predicted vote share versus the, pre the, the chance of actually winning. So it's two different levels of uncertainty here, two different measurements of uncertainty, but it's really easy to get those confused um, and to think that this means your vote share or that there's a 60% chance that he's going to win, but that's totally separate. Um, this actually got hotly contested as well. Um, the 538 people got lots of angry mails, emails because of this. Um, this was a much closer race. This is when Beto O'Rourke was running against Ted Cruz in 2018. This is before... Um, uh, Beto became the, or ran for president. And so here we have a three and four chance that uh, Ted Cruz wins and a one and four chance that the Democratic Party wins. Um, they tried their hardest to get this into numbers that make sense for people. And so instead of saying 75%, they downplayed that and said three and four instead, which is good practice. Um, but if you look at their forecasted vote shares, you have overlapping confidence intervals. So Ted Cruz was likely going to get about 51%. Beto would get about 47%. Um, there's a chance that those will flip. Um, and that's reflected in part by this probability that there's a 1 in 4 chance or a 25% chance that Beto would win. Um, but translating the vote shares here to the probabilities, again, those are two different scales, uh, two different things that you're measuring. This is the number of simulations that Ted Cruz wins, wins and this is the predicted vote share based on a whole bunch of different models. And so they're not the same thing, but often when people look at this, they assume that it's the same thing or they confuse the two or switch the two and it, it's difficult, but it's important to understand this. Um, and so we have all sorts of misperceptions of probability, even when we talk about the weather. So when you wake up in the morning and you ask Alexa what the weather is going to be like that day, um, she'll say that there's a 30% chance of rain. Um, and then it doesn't rain. And so do you get mad at Alexa for telling you there's a 30% chance of rain? No, because there was a chance. Um, and if it does rain and there's only a 10% chance of rain, does that mean she was wrong too? No, because there was a chance too. We just misperceive what actual probability means. And so in the case of weather, having some sort of chance of rain is actually this, this formula here. It's the probability that it's going to rain times the area that you're looking at. So if you're forecasting rain for, an, for a big city, um, it could be that you have a rainstorm that's coming through, but it's only gonna come through a third of the city here. And this part of the city is not going to get any rain that day. Um, and they know through models that the clouds are definitely not, not gonna make it over there. But the weather forecast will say that there's a 33% chance of rain for the city in general. Because of this math here, there's a hundred percent chance of rain that it'll it'll hundred percent chance that it'll rain in this third of the city, zero percent chance that it's going to rain in this part of the city, and so the overall chance for the whole city is thirty three percent. And so if you're over here and you wake up and you decide to take an, an umbrella that day, but you don't get rained on, it's not that you were wrong; it's just that you were in the wrong part of the city and the area was too large. Um, nowadays, forecasts are actually really good at shrinking down these areas. Um, if you go to Weather Underground, um, which is a website that um, has very narrow slices of area that tell you the, the probability of rain, um, there's a website called Dark Sky that Apple just bought that has very, very hyper tiny areas um, that will tell you, it will send you notifications to your phone. 
um, within like five minutes of it about to rain because it, it's looking at very, very tiny areas. And so because of that, they're able to get more accurate um, forecasts just for that specific area. Um, because if you want to improve this, this forecast, you shrink the area down and then you know better what the probability is. Um, if you could cut the city into thirds and say 0% chance, 0% chance, 100% chance, you'll get a lot happier people. Um, but again, we're, we're misperceiving this. Another problem with this is that's not the only chance of rain. Um, you're not always certain that the storm is going to go through this part of the city. And so um, weather forecasts will actually do simulations, kind of like election forecasts, where they'll run 10,000 versions of that day or of that hour, and they'll count up how many versions had it rain and how many versions had it not rain. Um, and then that's also kind of the percent chance of rain um, given all of the different simulations and the models they had. So you have all these different levels of uncertainty that are interacting. And so the fact that we have these magical apps that tell us the probability of rain is like super cool. Um, so don't like misperceive um, when, you, when you get like a 50% chance of rain and it doesn't rain or a 10% chance of rain and it does, don't get mad. Like just you're in a parallel universe, which is cool. It's the universe where it rained. Um, we also misperceive randomness. And so if we were in person, I wish we could do this because this is one of my favorite in-class activities because we stink at detecting randomness. Um, this activity, what I, what I typically have people do is I have you get into groups, like three or four different groups in the classroom. Um, half of the groups are assigned to get a coin and flip the coin uh, 20 times and you write down the sequence of heads and tails that you get. So if you flip it and you get a heads, you write down head, flip it again, write down heads or tails, etc. And so you get a, a row of 20 heads and tails um, all in a line. So that's what half the groups do. The other half of the groups um, have to make that same chain of heads and tails, but make it look as random as possible to not use a coin and just write down a sequence of heads and tails. And then I have all of the groups write down their sequences up on the board at the front. And then we try to guess as a class which ones were generated by coins and which ones are generated by people. And almost all 100% of the time, we can figure out which ones were coins and which ones were people. And it's because um, when you're flipping a coin, there's a high probability that you get long sequences of heads. You can have five heads in a row or six heads in a row. And that's not weird. That's just kind of what happens randomly. Um, if you're writing the chain by hand, what happens often when you're doing that is you'll start writing heads, 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 and then you'll think, oh, that's too many heads in a row. I better switch the tails so it doesn't look like I'm purposely choosing heads. And so you'll switch the tails and do tails a couple times and then switch back the heads so it doesn't look, you look like you're doing too many head or tails. And so you keep switching to make it look random when actually that messes up the randomness because you can have lots of, of um, heads or tails in a row and that is a totally normal thing that happens with random numbers. Um, and so we have this misperception of randomness where if we think um, that if, if we see a whole bunch of random events happening in a row, we'll think that maybe a basketball player has a hot hand or something. We talked about this last week in one of our sessions um, where we, we think there are random patterns and then the random patterns disappear. And that's because randomness just happens and we don't fully understand that uh, conceptually. Um, and so we, we mess it up. We try to make things look random when they're not. Um, some other examples of this and where um, public sector organizations have been trying to communicate this uncertainty, but also failing at times, um, is with hurricane forecasts. This is actually Alberto Cairo's kind of uh, one of his big things he talks about all the time on the internet. He talks about it throughout his book um, because he lives in Florida, so he's on the front lines of these things. Um, the the government agency in charge of forecasting um, hurricanes, NOAA here, they have kind of a standard map that they show here. So this is Hurricane Maria from 2017. Um, and so if you look at this forecast here, it looks like the storm is, is down here in the Southern Caribbean, and then it's gonna cross through Puerto Rico and then go up this way. Um, they have a giant disclaimer on this map here that says this path um, does not show the size of the storm. It shows the probable path of the storm center. So what these, these white areas and these dotted areas show is the confidence interval for the path. So it could maybe go down here. There's, 
it could go somewhere anywhere in here and then by the time it gets up to this dotted area it could be all over the map there that's like thousand mile radius across there it could be anywhere um, they don't know exactly where but one thing that happens is when people look at this map they often assume that the storm is actually going to be that big um, and it's not that we're dumb when we read this map it just looks like um, the size of a storm because when they when you show um, satellite photos you can see the clouds getting bigger and bigger and you can see how giant the storm is and this looks kind of like a map representation of that and so often you think like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger um, but that's not actually what it's showing that's just probability um, but again it's very easy to, to misperceive that and get confused um, some news organizations have tried to fix this and so this is the same um, Hurricane Maria map but the New York Times back in 2017 tried to adjust it and so they actually have two different um, filled areas here. They have this area down at the bottom where the storm actually is, and that is the actual size of the storm, basically. It's showing where hurricane force winds are, and it's showing where the tropical storm force winds are. And so you can assume that kind of anywhere in this shaded area, that's where like the actual hurricane is. And so you want to worry about that area. This more transparent gray area here isn't the size of the storm. This is the NOAA 95% um, confidence interval where the storm might be. And so they're trying to distinguish this when you're looking at it by using two different fill colors or three different fill colors because they have the hurricane force winds here. And so that way you can see that this is kind of the actual size of the storm and this is the probability of the storm. And whether or not that improved interpretation, I don't know if anybody's done any studies on that, but like to me, that makes more conceptual sense looking at that. You know that this is definitely the size. This is the probability. Instead of this maybe being the size or probability, it says that it's the probability up at the top, but you have to hope that people read that. Um, and so mapping um, this, this fill aesthetic to two different variables here is actually fairly helpful when you're trying to communicate this kind of stuff. Um, Another example of communicating uncertainty is if we go back to elections. Um, this needle was created in 2016 um, for the uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Donald Trump presidential election. And on election night, I remember seeing this, like logging into the New York Times website to see results coming in. And there was this giant needle there that was wiggling back and forth. And I got really excited. Uh, lots of people on the internet got really excited because it looked like it was tracking live vote returns because um, it was wiggling around. And so like as they're counting different precincts and it's going to go up and it's going to go down, and it's kind of jiggling around there. And so it looked like a real time thing. And so I remember staring at this for like 20 minutes and it was super exciting. I was watching it going up and down. Um, and then people on Twitter started looking into the source code because they wanted to figure out how they were getting all of these live precinct level results so fast. And they discovered that this isn't actually live precinct level results. This is just random noise that they programmed in JavaScript to just make it wiggle randomly. And so I spent like 20 minutes on election night assuming like, oh, a new county came in. Oh, it went away. Oh, it, and like following the votes that way when really it's just randomness. It was just jiggling around. Um, and so it caused all sorts of anxiety. Um, it, hopefully you saw that in the, in the video interview um, with Amanda Cox. Um, lots of people actually hated this in part because it seemed like it was encoding time as an aesthetic here. It seemed like it was kind of a live view of vote counting when it wasn't. Um, it was a noble attempt. They're trying to show the uncertainty of these counts. Um, and they have kind of this shaded area here showing the uncertainty. But then this needle moving around, that was just kind of extra noise that didn't, didn't quite communicate the uncertainty. Um, after 2016, they've actually kind of gone all in on this thing. Um, so this is from 2017. There was a special election in Georgia for um, a, house, uh, a house election. And they brought the needle back out and Twitter responded very negatively. And they keep doing this. Every election, you'll see the dial now on the New York Times website. Um, and it's just what they do. And they've just embraced it. Um, I think they've gotten rid of the jittering. Um, and so now it's just more of a static dial. And when it does update, it shows the actual like dial moving um, to so the dial points at an actual number instead of just moving around, which is less anxiety inducing. Um, and again, not mapping kind of this idea of time onto the graph when there is no time. 
And so that, that does help. But that's kind of different attempts at showing uncertainty. It's a hard thing to do, so kudos to the New York Times for doing this. It's, it's a cool thing. Um, without the jitter, it's, it's a cool thing. Um, so yeah, uncertainty is important to, uh, important to communicate. It's hard to communicate. People are experimenting with it. There's no perfect way to do it, um, in part because we all misinterpret what uncertainty means and what probability and randomness mean. Um, and so if we can create graphs that are good at communicating uncertainty, um, then we'll have very powerful tools of communication. So that's what we'll be talking about for the rest of today.